so we are recording here, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Saeed Khan. He is a lecturer at Wayne State and senior research fellow at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. And uh, Saeed is, um, uh, his primary research area is on identity politics of Muslim diaspora communities in the U.S., the U.K., and in Europe. He's also a founding member and senior research fellow at the Institute for Soci Social Policy and Understanding. That's a think tank promoting the analysis of U.S. social and domestic policy. He's also a regular contributor to the BBC, NPR, Quartz, and he's a panelist on Turning Point for The National on the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Saeed, and thank you again so very much for doing this. We really pre appreciate it. Well, thank you, Deborah, and thank you, Tiffany, and uh, thank you all for being uh, on uh, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the, in the U.S. at, uh, at this time. Uh, it's a very timely topic, uh, understanding Islam, and uh, thank you so much for your interest uh, within it. Uh, having said that, let's uh, just go ahead and begin at the beginning of uh, looking at Islam, uh, primarily from a historical perspective. And I think it's important to recognize that while it is a religion, uh, clearly it is a global phenomenon at the same time, uh, something that has been uh, historically present for 14 centuries and uh, is as complex and as diverse uh, as any topic that uh, one would want to tackle. And certainly as uh, journalists in the field of, uh, of religion, uh, I'm sure you can appreciate its complexity and its diversity. Now, if we take a look at, uh, for example, the time in which Islam emerges, and which gives context to so much of the primary sources of authority of Islam, which we'll discuss uh, uh, momentarily. We have to understand the anthropology of the time, uh, the politics of the time, the social structures of the time in pre-Islamic Arabia. Now, the inception of Islam was in really the late 6th, early 7th century in Arabia, a tribal society uh, by and large, a patriarchal society, and one that subscribed to polytheism as the dominant religious base. Now, it was not the only religious uh, model in the region. There were pockets of uh, Christians and Jews uh, and Sabians who were a very uh, unaffiliated form of monotheism. There was also, to the north of the Arabian Peninsula, two very large monotheistic empires, the Byzantine Empire, of course, being Christian, and the Persian Empire being Zoroastrian, also a monotheistic faith. The thing about the western side of the Arabian Peninsula was that it was a major pipeline for trade and commerce. Uh, shipping and uh, other modes of transportation would bring goods into the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, and along the western side there would be trade routes going all the way into the great trading capitals of Syria, Jerusalem, and off into Asia Minor, finding their way into Europe. So it's important to understand then how this plays a role in developing uh, Islam as a religion. Now, Islam has never been uh, one to promote itself as an original faith. It sees itself, uh, rightly so, as one of the so-called Abrahamic faiths with Judaism and Christianity preceding it. And we find that a lot of the narratives of Islam uh, are then couched within Christian and uh, Jewish uh, authorities, as well as history. So we'll find uh, stories within the sources of Islam that, of course, are going to be very familiar to Christians and Jews in particular. Now, one of the major centers of uh, Western Arabia was the city of Mecca. Not only was it a commercial hub, but, and this shows you the connection between religion and economics, it was also a center for pilgrimage. It was the epicenter of the pagan polytheistic religion of the Arabian Peninsula, one that consisted of a pantheon of about 360 idols. All of the representations of these uh, various deities were housed in one place known as the Kaaba, also known as the uh, Noble Sanctuary. And so people would come from far and afield to Mecca to uh, make pilgrimage. But also back then, given the fact that uh, it wasn't uh, with transportation limitations uh, and such, an area where one could just zip in and zip back out, 
no ATMs, for example, people would then uh, come there and spend sometimes weeks or even months because sometimes it would take weeks and months for them to get there. They would bring along with them for their own sustenance as well as to barter to uh, maintain uh, the income to stay there whatever goods and wares they had from their regions. That kind of synergy in Mecca allowed for a very bustling uh, industry. And the tribe that was in charge of Mecca was the tribe of the Quraysh. Well, as one can understand, if they have a monopoly on Mecca and on the pilgrimage uh, industry, if you will, uh, they became very, very prosperous. Unfortunately, along with that prosperity, there was a lot of income inequality and what otherwise should have been a very symmetrical, balanced, and uh, productive tribal model, whereby the ethos of uh, Arabia at this time was that the weaker members of a tribe uh, demanded and commanded uh, protection, these things started to unravel. And so we find that sociologically, around the middle to late 6th century, Arabian society starts to hemorrhage when it comes to uh, deviating from its own uh, very good values of hospitality, uh, promotion of wisdom, strength, and also protection of the vulnerable. In the year 595, uh, born into this ruling tribe of Mecca, the Quraysh, is a man by the name of Muhammad. Now, Muhammad comes in in 570. Uh, sorry, I think I said 595 by mistake. Uh, 570, and uh, he's orphaned. He uh, is the son of Abdullah, who's a member of the Quraysh, but from one of the branches that isn't considered as strong or as powerful or as wealthy. His mother dies uh, shortly after he's born, his father before he was born. I'm sorry, I think I said that his mother was born, uh, died before he was born. He was, she, she dies uh, shortly after that. Father uh, pre-deceased uh, Muhammad's birth. And uh, he's raised in the household of his grandfather, who happened to be the tribal chieftain. And then after that, uh, in the household of his uncle, who succeeds uh, Muhammad's grandfather as the head of the Quraysh. Now, his early childhood and life was pretty unremarkable. Uh, in fact, uh, because he was an orphan, he was somewhat marginalized sociologically. Uh, and yet at the same time, he developed a reputation of being very trustworthy. He was employed as a caravan agent in which he represented uh, the Quraysh's uh, trade uh, caravans to the north, as well as representing uh, the tribe when other traders would come to, uh, to Mecca. And in this way, he was uh, probably not like many other people within this business model of Mecca. He marries in the year 595 uh, to a woman who's 15 years older than he is, who is not only independently wealthy, but in fact is his employer. And this is Khadija. Uh, they raise a family. Uh, they had a couple of sons who didn't uh, survive past infancy, and they had four daughters that did. Now, one of the things that happened with Muhammad is he would retreat to some of the mountains around Mecca in order to get away from the bustle and the pollution of the city to find a quiet place to contemplate. And at the age of 40, in the year 610, he had, according to Islamic tradition, a rather uh, remarkable uh, episode. It was during this time in a cave uh, one night in the ninth month of the uh, calendar, which is the month of Ramadan, that Muhammad is uh, to have had a visitor. While he thought he was by himself, uh, he is enwrapped in a very tight embrace, uh, almost uh, choking the uh, breath out of him. And a single word is uttered, uh, the word recite. In Arabic, it is ikra. Sometimes it's translated as read. Uh, Muhammad is startled, of course, because he thought he was alone and he doesn't uh, feel any other presence there. And he immediately and reflexively says, I cannot. Uh, Muhammad was uh, probably technically literate in the sense that he probably understood enough of how to be a caravan agent, uh, but he was not a lettered man. Uh, this voice was apparently not happy with his honesty and tightened the embrace uh, and repeated the word recite. And this happened about three or four times until, according to Islamic tradition, uh, Muhammad felt as though he could no longer breathe. And the voice then says, recite in the name of the Lord thy creator, 
who created you out of a single clot of blood. And this becomes, according to Islamic tradition, the first revelation that Muhammad receives. And it then goes on to become the first verse that is codified in the holy scripture of Islam, uh, the Quran. Now, at the time, as you can see from this exchange, there is still no conferment of prophethood onto the prophet. There is really no mandate or even message that is coherent. And this shows that it took a gradual process by which Muhammad then came into his prophethood. Now, some of the first people who converted to uh, Islam or to accept this message, which was being developed, was his wife and also his close friends and family, one such uh, individual being Ali, uh, his cousin and the son of uh, the Prophet's uncle in, which, uh, in whose household the Prophet was reared. Uh, most of the people who first start to accept this message are very low-key uh, for fear of upsetting the dominant uh, force within Mecca, which is, of course, polytheistic. And over several years, 10 to be exact, the message becomes more refined. Uh, it starts to preach uh, a form of polytheism, or, sorry, monotheism. Uh, issues of social justice are done by allegory. Uh, initially, there's not a direct criticism or indictment of polytheistic uh, Arab society, because this would seem to be uh, a bit too seditious. Uh, but over time, we find that other members of Meccan society, not just the marginalized, start to subscribe to Muhammad's message, including some who are wealthy and powerful. This then be, uh, becomes seen as a threat to both the economic viability of Mecca, I mean, after all, being a polytheistic hub, uh, a member of uh, the dominant uh, tribe, uh, on the periphery though he might be, is, is going to be seen as problematic. Politically, and even when it comes to a matter of honor, the Quraysh were feeling threatened. So there are a lot of reasons why this uh, sort of insurgency, if you will, from within Mecca was started to see uh, as being a threat. Now, for several years, as people started to complain bitterly to the tribal chieftain, uh, Muhammad's uncle, his uncle would resist trying to uh, punish uh, Muhammad. He had a very fond uh, place for him in his heart. And in the year 619, uh, both Muhammad's wife Khadija, his only wife during his, the period where he lived in Mecca, and his uncle, a man by the name of Abu Talib, both die. So 619 becomes seen as this year of sorrow where Muhammad loses his uh, main source of consortium, his wife, and protection from uh, his uncle, who was the tribal chieftain. This then brings about a lot of peril for Muhammad and his small group of followers, a couple of hundred. And for three years, they face an awful lot of persecution from the rest of the Quraysh and the Meccan society. It is by good fortune that in the year 622, Muhammad receives an invitation to migrate to a city 250 miles north of Mecca, known as Yatrib. He had so uh, solved successfully a dispute between the two major tribes in Yatrib who had been in a state of political impasse for years. And as a result of that and their knowledge of what he was enduring in Mecca, they then invite him to Yatrib along with his followers. This occurs in 622. When the prophet reaches uh, the city, uh, they rename it in his honor uh, from Yathrib to Medina. And this year is also significant because it marks the start of the Islamic calendar. It is year one. And this migration itself is known as the Hijrah. Now, it is in Medina that we have a second phase of uh, really the prophet's ministry, uh, the first being the 10 years in uh, Mecca. And in Medina, uh, uh, or where he is for, actually, I'm sorry, uh, 12 years in Mecca from 610 to 622, and then 10 years in Medina from 622 to his death in 632, Muhammad establishes the first state. He embarks upon drafting a constitution which gives citizenship to all uh, Medina's residents. Uh, this would include the pagan tribes that already lived there. It would include the refugee Muslims who migrated there, as well as a series of Jewish tribes which lived within the precinct 
of Medina. And this document is seen as being groundbreaking because it is for the first time that it establishes citizenship based on locality, irrespective of religious affiliation or ethnicity or race. But nonetheless, uh, despite the fact that he was 250 miles away from Mecca, there was a matter of honor for the people of Mecca that here was this wayward renegade uh, group that had in fact fled to uh, Medina, survived, and now were even thriving. And so there are three major battles uh, in which he has to engage with his uh, former family members, the Quraysh. Uh, the first one ends with a win for Muhammad. The second one is a defeat. And the third one is an impasse or a tie. Uh, it is in the year uh, 630, however, that Muhammad returns to Mecca victoriously and is allowed back into the city with no bloodshed. Uh, the city is surrendered to uh, Muhammad. He destroys the idols in the Kaaba, in a sense cleansing it and restoring it to being a hub of monotheism. Because according to Islamic tradition, the Kaaba was the first house of worship built by Adam after he descended from the Garden of Eden. Now, Muhammad dies of natural causes in the year 632 at roughly the age of 63. And it is from this point on that we have the new era of Islam, which is the post-prophetic uh, period. Now, when it comes to the theological basis of Islam, uh, you are probably familiar with uh, the structure of the five pillars. And this essentially is a grouping of five acts of uh, worship or ritual. The first one is a declaration of faith. There is prayer, fasting, tithing or almsgiving, as well as the pilgrimage. And we'll go through each one of these. So the first one is a declaration of faith known in Arabic as the Shahada. And it's a fairly simple attestation that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is his messenger. And this is not only an affirmation of monotheism, but it shows the negation of even the possibility of polytheism, because again, this is the milieu in which uh, Islam emerges. It is also an affirmation that Muhammad is a messenger of God, but not the only messenger of God. Again, uh, verifying that Islam believes that there have been an entire series of messengers uh, that God has had come down to earth, starting with Adam, but including Noah. Uh, it would include Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, uh, Jesus, John the Baptist, uh, and several others, and of course culminating in Muhammad, him being, according to Islam, the last of the messengers or prophets. The second uh, pillar is prayer. Five times a day, uh, Muslims are obliged to face Mecca and offer their prayer. And it punctuates the day into the pre-dawn prayer, so right before the sun comes up, uh, the early afternoon prayer after the sun has crossed its zenith or its high point, the late afternoon prayer, which occurs sometime between the sun being in its midpoint between its apogee and the horizon, the fourth prayer being the dusk prayer, which occurs after the sun has descended below the horizon, and then the nighttime prayer, which is about an hour and a half after uh, the sun goes down. And so what it allows for is that during the waking hours, there's not a significant period of time which goes by where one doesn't, if you will, tag back up and uh, have a conversation with, with God in order to not only uh, reaffirm uh, the connection to the divine, uh, but also to uh, at least provide a reminder for one's moral and ethical compass that, uh, that God is always uh, present, as well as to give gratitude and appreciation for the day. The third pillar is fasting, or what is known as psalm, and it occurs in the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, which is Ramadan. Now, it's important to remember that uh, the Islamic calendar is based on a lunar model, uh, not a solar model like the Gregorian calendar, so it retrogrades 10 days 
every uh, solar year. So this year, the month of Ramadan will begin approximately June the 7th and last till about July the 6th or the 7th. Uh, a lunar month can be 29 or, thir or uh, 30 days. Uh, next year, it will begin 10, year, uh, 10 days before that uh, in the end of May and so on. During the uh, so-called daylight hours, meaning from the moment of the first prayer of the day uh, to the sunset prayer, uh, Muslims, if they are of physical ability and have uh, reached the age of puberty and are not either pregnant or nursing uh, or have any other kind of health issues, must abstain from eating, drinking, engaging in marital relations, smoking, uh, or anything else which would uh, be seen as either an ingestion uh, or uh, would be seen, for example, in the case of lying or backbiting as something that one shouldn't be doing anyways. It is a month which then provides a very rigorous exercise and discipline to gain a higher level of spirituality and allow people to pursue a more reflective nature uh, within that time. It's not intended to be an either or. Uh, one is still supposed to maintain the regular schedule while fasting. In fact, uh, uh, two years ago during the Soccer World Cup, uh, the uh, Algeria national team very famously was fasting uh, while they were still uh, playing matches. The fourth pillar is called zakat, uh, which is almsgiving. Uh, every uh, Muslim should give 2.5% of assets on hand. It is a way of cleansing one's income in case uh, they receive some of it from ill-gotten gain. Uh, it also prevents uh, hoarding uh, because money that is not in circulation helps nobody. And of course, it also promotes charity. And the fifth pillar is pilgrimage or the hajj. If one is physically and financially able to do so within one's lifetime, then one should journey to Mecca to perform the rituals that were actually reenactments of events that happened uh, in the family of Abraham. Again, affirming this notion of Islam being one of the Abrahamic monotheistic faiths. It is uh, a, uh, an event that happens roughly 70 days after the conclusion of the month of Ramadan. So this year, the Hajj will be uh, in the beginning of uh, September. Along with the five articles of faith, there's also what's known as the six, uh, uh, or the five pillars of Islam, there's also what's known as the six articles of faith. There's the belief in the oneness of God. Again, the uh, idea of monotheism is very, very strong. Uh, the belief in God's messengers, uh, as we stated before, going all the way from Adam through to Muhammad. The belief in God's revealed texts or books. This would include the Torah. This would include the Gospel of Jesus. Uh, this would include the Psalms. And, of course, uh, the uh, Quran, which uh, Muslims regard and revere to be the unadulterated uh, literal word of, of, of and by God. Uh, belief in angels belief in a day of reckoning or a day of judgment, and belief in pre the divine predestination, that God knows, records, wills, and has created everything. Now, man, according to Islam, still has free will, but God uh, has still predestined uh, everything. When it comes to the ethos of Islam on a sociological level, there's really three uh, obligations or directions where the Muslim's obligation is uh, pointed. One is to God, and this is discharged by the performance uh, sincerely of rituals and remembrance of the divine. Another is to society, uh, family, and community, and this is discharged through the pursuit of social justice and civic duty. And then there's even, from an Islamic perspective, uh, a responsibility that one has to oneself. And this is discharged by dietary regulations, as well as uh, maintaining uh, good and uh, beneficial health uh, uh, practices and habits. Now, I mentioned uh, the Quran, uh, which is re regarded by Muslims as being the primary source of authority in Islam. And the Quran is divided into surahs, or what we would call chapters, about 114 of them, uh, further broken down into about 6,000 verses or ayahs, 
And uh, another form of demarcation is paras, which are 30 sections. Now, these 6,000 some odd verses are verses that, according to Islamic tradition, were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad through the 23-year period of his life from the year 610 all the way through his death in Medina in the year 632. And they are a source of several different dimensions, uh, the ethical, the legal, as well as the spiritual. And scholars, of course, for the last 14 centuries have uh, been very judicious in trying to interpret uh, the Quran, as well as the internal symmetry of the Quran. Uh, many of them will contend that those verses which were revealed uh, to the Prophet while he was in Mecca tend to have more of a focus on the spiritual, again, trying to affirm monotheism and distinguish it from paganism, as well as making statements uh, against the social inequities of Mecca at the time. Those verses which are revealed during the Medinan period from 622 to 632 have a focus more on uh, state craft and state building. Here we have more issues dealing with contract, uh, interpersonal relations and the such. But that's not the only source of authority uh, in Islam. Uh, after all, it's only 6,000 verses, and uh, some of them may be seen as more allegorical than empirical. It is the sunnah, or the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, which then serves as the second source of authority. Uh, the sunnah, or the way of the Prophet, is in, encoded or embodied in what's called the hadith, which is the chronicle or the written chronicle of the prophet's teachings, sayings, and actions. One of the things that the prophet had was a very, very loyal group of companions who were with him all the time, and they documented, again, very judiciously, what he said why he said it, when he said it, uh, in order to then understand his interpretation of what were the Quranic principles that he had received. And so what we find is, as an example, where the Quran uh, establishes the importance and the obligation of daily prayer, the mechanics of prayer are not within the Quran. Those are known to Muslims through the Sunnah. Uh, because of watching the prophet and then the emulation of the prophet as being the exemplar of what is the divine message and the divine mandate. Now, just like every other religion, uh, Islam is uh, not impervious to denominate uh, sectarianism. And we find here that there are two major sects uh, in Islam, the Sunni and the Shi'i. And of course, today, with so much of the conflicts occurring in the Middle East, these two uh, words have gained quite a bit of currency. Uh, I remember growing up in England, and uh, it was at the time of the Troubles. And so we knew, uh, even as uh, young school kids, uh, the difference between Catholics and Protestants because of Northern Ireland and what was being waged there, not necessarily because we were taking courses in uh, theology. So let's go ahead and unpack then what are the major tenets of these two uh, sects. So if we take a look at the Sunni sect, first of all, it is uh, by far the largest uh, denomination or major denomination of Islam constituting somewhere about 85 to 90 percent of the global uh, Muslim population. Uh, some of its features are that it has a very decentralized clergy. So in a way, and again, this is a very, very loose approximation uh, and analogy, uh, in that sense, it would be uh, akin to Protestantism. It believes that the leader of the Muslim world is the caliph, uh, but he is simply the administrative leader, or if you will, uh, the head of the executive branch of government. It is his responsibility to enforce uh, the divine law as it is interpreted by and as it is legislated by uh, other scholars. So the leader is uh, chosen uh, from uh, the, uh, the community through the consensus of the community. Now, unfortunately, in Islamic history, uh, the caliph was not necessarily chosen by consensus uh, after about the 
middle of the seventh century, uh, generally speaking, it was a matter of might makes right. But at least uh, at its inception, this was the idea and the ideal behind Sunnism and uh, the selection or the election of the caliph. Now the Shi'i uh, have a much more structuralized, centralized uh, uh, clergy akin to, if you will, the Catholic Church. For them, the leader of the community is not the caliph, but the imam. Uh, we'll use this with a capital I to avoid the confusion that the leader of prayer at any mosque is an imam. We'll just say that with a lowercase i. One of the major distinctions here is who is qualified to be the leader of uh, the community. For the Shi'i, they believe that the bloodline of the prophet has an intrinsic uh, authenticity for authority. And so they believe that starting with the prophet and then going through the prophet's progeny, uh, particularly those that came through his daughter Fatima and her husband Ali, who also happened to be the prophet's cousin, and then their children, that there is both uh, a sense of infallibility in this bloodline for the leadership and there is something uh, sacred about that leadership, such that there would be uh, an authenticity of those authority figures. Again, quite a distinction from that in Sunni uh, Islam, patrilineage being the mode of succession. Now, of course, as you see, the distinctions here are not so much doctrinal as they are political in creating the split, as I would submit is really at the core of the split of uh, Protestantism and Catholicism as to the church authority. But over time, we find that this divergence has created different schools of legal interpretation, uh, different identities, and in a sense, almost parallel lives within uh, the world of Islam. Now, taking a look at this wide arc of 14 centuries, uh, during the so-called golden period of Islam uh, of about a thousand years ago, but not limited to a thousand years ago, we find a tremendous amount of intellectual output. While Europe was languishing in what is sometimes colloquially called the Dark Ages, we find that Islam was thriving with its uh, culture, with its arts, and with its pursuit of knowledge. It was also very uh, well situated geographically to be in between the West, where there was knowledge going back to ancient times in Greece, and knowledge which was being produced in uh, Asia, particularly India and China. And what the Muslim scholars a thousand years ago did was they took knowledge from everywhere and they tried to perfect it. So in the area of philosophy, they translated and pers uh, preserved the works of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and in fact, even expanded many of these concepts. The uh, famed uh, scholar uh, Ibn Rushd, or also known as Averroes, was an Aristotelian, and his work was then translated by Maimonides in Cordoba, Spain, and the work of both Averroes and Maimonides and their meditations on Aristotle reached the West through Thomas Aquinas. So this chain of transmission is something that uh, Islam played a very pivotal role in providing that kind of knowledge. Similarly, when we take a look at architecture and art, Gothic architecture, which we consider to be sort of the defining feature of so many a cathedral in Europe, uh, has its uh, basis in uh, Islamic science and design. Uh, arabesque designs, geometric patterns are also a hallmark feature of Islamic art. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the depiction of human beings and animals is prohibited so as to avoid uh, the potential for worship of graven images. Calligraphy is another very major uh, area of Islamic uh, expression. Science and mathematics, while the number zero uh, is not from the so-called Muslim world, uh, it came from the Hindic or Indian civilization, uh, the zero was incorporated into 
mathematics in the Muslim world. Uh, the use of Arabic numbers uh, moving away from Roman numerals proved to be uh, a much appreciated change for any mathematician. Uh, we also find that work on fractions, plane geometry of, uh, of Euclid, and spherical trigonometry also are refined. Uh, the very field of algebra, an Arabic word, is developed uh, in Islamic civilization. And the translation, again, of Greek texts of mathematics uh, proved to be very important. Pythagorean theorem, uh, other uh, sources of mathematical knowledge from uh, ancient sources are then moved forward in uh, Islamic epistems. In medicine, uh, the very concept of the hospital develops in uh, Baghdad in the 10th century as a place to quarantine the ill. Uh, hospitals historically were, uh, had this as, they made, as their major purpose. It wasn't necessarily to make people well. It was to sequester the ill from the general population. Uh, surgery using anesthesia was something that was uh, deployed in the Muslim world uh, 800 years ago. And Ibn Sina, or Avicenna, uh, created a treatise on medicine which was used in Europe uh, as uh, late as uh, the 19th century. Uh, poetry, of course, is a, another very uh, uh, ebullient field in, uh, in Islamic civilization. Uh, the poetry of Omar Khayyam and Rumi uh, still are uh, considered to be uh, very rich and uh, appreciated the world over. Now, when we look at the five eras, of uh, Islamic history. Uh, we can take a look at the age of expansion, how Islam uh, grew as an empire. And again, it was not the only empire that had a religious affiliation. The Byzantine and the Persian empires, uh, for example, uh, also were affiliated by their religion. We have the period after Muhammad dies in 632, about a 29 year period that includes the first four caliphs. Then we have two major dynasties, the Umayyad, which lasts from 750 to uh, about, uh, or 661 to 750, and then the Abbasid dynasty, which lasts from 750 to 1258. We also have the Age of Tolerance of Muslim Spain, which was from 711 to 1492, included the cities of Seville and Cordoba and Granada. And then the Age of Empires, which emerges around the 14th century, which includes the Ottoman Empire based uh, chiefly in Turkey, but uh, encompassed land in three different continents, including North Africa and, of course, Asia. The Safavid Empire based in Persia, and then the Mughal Empire, which was based in India. Uh, then we have, with the advent of the colonial era, an age of decline of Muslim civilizations as they came into occupation by Western European forces. And after the end of colonialism, which uh, arguably is not that long ago, um, anywhere from 40 to 60 years ago, we find that now a lot of the Muslim world is starting to emerge or reemerge from that uh, with a lot of uncertainty. Now, if we take a look at Islam in America, again, there's really several uh, stages that we can examine. Uh, Islam is actually, uh, in America, is older than the country itself. Uh, many uh, of the West African slaves that uh, were brought to the United States were, in fact, uh, Muslim and were forcibly converted by uh, slave owners. Uh, we have the Neo-American era, where there are examples of uh, interchange and uh, interaction with the Muslim world. In fact, Morocco was the first uh, country to formally recognize uh, the United States of America uh, upon its independence. Uh, immigration has been rather fluid. Uh, there have been periods where it has been uh, uh, allowed, uh, but by and large until 1965, there were significant quotas that were placed on uh, people coming from countries in the Muslim world. They may not have targeted Muslims directly, uh, but because of uh, exclusions of peoples from Africa and Asia, Muslims were involved in that as well. Of course, there are exceptions. Uh, Lebanese uh, uh, Muslims came to the United States from uh, the uh, declining Ottoman Empire in the 1920s. Uh, many of them ended up here in the Metro Detroit area working in the assembly lines of Henry Ford. There is also the very important uh, milestone 
of the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the opening of immigration quotas, it is at this time that we have a major influx of people from South and Southeast Asia, as well as from Africa, coming to the United States. And then as a result of them staying here, there is, of course, indigenous growth, uh, not only in immigrant populations, but through conversion uh, to Anglo-European and African-American Muslims as well. And then, of course, we have Islam in the United States today. Depending on the report, uh, depending on the scholarship, estimates place it uh, very conservatively at 2.35, and perhaps uh, more on the liberal side, somewhere between six to seven million Muslims in the US. So somewhere between six tenths to 3% of the American population. And this, of course, has to be seen in the context of a 1.7 billion worldwide Muslim population. And there are some myths that uh, perhaps uh, need to uh, be uh, shattered here. While many people think of um, Muslim and Arab as being synonymous, uh, in fact, it's not. All Arabs are not Muslim and all Muslims are not Arab. And in the United States, in fact, the Arab Muslim population is by far the minority. Uh, one of the largest segments is uh, the African-American Muslim population, and about equally a population of South Asian, Southeast Asian, Anglo-European or white convert, and African and Hispanic Muslims. In fact, Hispanic Muslims are the fastest growing Muslim demographic in the country. There are somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 Islamic centers. Most of them have been built within the last generation uh, in order to absorb, obviously, um, expanding and more diffuse populations, uh, moving away from concentrations uh, of uh, Muslims in places like New York, Detroit, Chicago, and Los Angeles. Now we find not only in urban centers like Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, and Atlanta, and Philadelphia, but also in smaller areas. In fact, in many rural communities, uh, one will find uh, Muslims living there either as professionals uh, or uh, as uh, business owners. So with that, I would like to go ahead and field uh, any questions that you have. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. Uh, there was so much great rich history and everything there. So I'm going to go through the questions as, uh, as asked. Uh, and this first question is from Betsy Shirley. Uh, and she said, you've given them a great introduction to the, orig the origin story of Islam from a scholarly perspective. How, and maybe more interestingly, why might religious adherents tell the same origin story differently? Wow, that's a, that's a tremendous story. Uh, I, I think uh, when it comes to Islam, uh, one of the, uh, the advantages of uh, Islam uh, in its, as you said, its creation story uh, is that uh, it, it comes fairly late onto the bus. Uh, and as a result of it, it uh, is not so much as uh, focused on its inception with Muhammad per se, not that that's not important, but it still affirms the idea as does Christianity and Judaism of the beginning of not the story of Islam, but the story of humankind going all the way back to Adam. Now, there are certain distinctions. Uh, for example, in uh, Islam, there is no concept of the original sin. And uh, the temptation in uh, the Garden of Eden is one uh, that uh, occurred with both Adam and Eve, and therefore both Adam and Eve uh, were uh, slapped on the wrist, so to speak, for the transgression. There is not the notion that this was either one or the other. And more importantly, that humankind is not bearing the onus of, uh, of that sin. Uh, this, of course, is a major departure from Christianity in particular in the understanding of how the creation story then affects uh, the ontology of, uh, of humankind moving forward. Great. And then, uh, secondly, um, a question about how uh, 
the Sunni and Shi sects are broken down geographically. And then I would like to add to that. Um, I know that in um, for years in many parts of the country, Sunni and, and Shia worship together in the same Islamic center, same mosque. Uh, and I just wonder in the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, now that there have been more, now that sectarian violence has grown, how is that affecting U.S. Uh, Sunni and Shi populations? Excellent. So let me, let me uh, take the second part of that question first, uh, looking at the American uh, perspective. Uh, the split in America between the Sunni and the Shi'i certainly has some uh, influence based on what is happening overseas, partly because these immigrant communities are personally impacted by it because of family or because of um, affiliations to national origin. But Excuse me, but I would suggest that the, the reason for this move away from Sunni and Shi'i praying in the same facilities has more to do with just simply the demographic growth of all of these communities mm -hmm. and for the idea that there is a gravitation uh, impulse that people have that uh, they'll get along with people that they're alike. Uh, but if they're more alike with more people, then they'll sort of move toward that subcategory. And so what we find is that with the emergence and the development of critical masses of either Sunni or Shi'i in particular locales, and with resources that are allocated uh, accordingly, you will find mosques that are then predominantly Sunni or predominantly Shi'i. And even further, you will find in each sect uh, sometimes mosques which are demarcated not so much by sect, but by, uh, by ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So you'll find mosques that are predominantly South Asian, mosques that are predominantly Arab, mosques that are predominantly something else, Bosnian, Turkish. And part of that is because of how the mosque is seen in America as an epicenter of social and cultural life. Mm -hmm. It is its, its uh, role in the public sphere, which is different from if you will, a Muslim majority country where the culture is already reinforcing that. Here in uh, the United States, you find then that uh, the mosque has to serve many purposes that perhaps it was not historically intended to serve. Now, as far as globally, where the sects are uh, concentrated, again, 85 to 90 percent of uh, the Muslim world is Sunni, but the areas where there are majority Shi'i populations are Iran, of course, which is somewhere around 92 percent, uh, Iraq, which has a majority uh, Shi'i population. Bahrain, interestingly, is three-fourths Shi'i, but it is ruled by a Sunni monarchy. Uh, Lebanon has a sizable uh, Shi'i population, and we find that there is a minority uh, Shi'i population in Syria that has uh, a, uh, but, but is in power in that country. There are other major Shi'i pockets in South Asia, in Pakistan, and in India, as well as in West Africa and in East Africa. And part of this uh, was a function of uh, the colonial era. The Shi'i Muslims migrated from uh, Lebanon and Syria to Senegal and uh, other countries in West Africa because they were Francophone. All of them were at one time part of the French Empire. And similarly, uh, Sunni uh, Indian Shia migrated to Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda because they were all part of the uh, British crown. Great. Then um, somebody's asking about the Nation of Islam and how do they fit into the uh, statistics that you gave us here in the U.S. And um, are, is the Nation of Islam, are they considered Muslims by, uh, by other Muslims in the United States? Wow, what a great question. So the Nation of Islam uh, develops as a liberation theology of political nationalism uh, in the 1930s, thanks to um, uh, Elijah Muhammad. Uh, their expression of Islam uh, comes to them by way of, uh, in fact, uh, Muslim immigrants. Uh, most scholars will point at as being uh, some South Asians uh, who came into contact with, uh, with Elijah Muhammad. Uh, it provided a counter narrative to what was, after all, for a lot of the African American community in the United States in the civil rights struggle, some hope to have something that was dissociated with 
uh, uh, Christianity, because in, in some quarters, and particularly with some racist pastors, it was difficult to uh, separate uh, the racism from, from the church, especially if it was being uh, preached from the pulpit. Now, interestingly enough, in the 1960s, and really at the apex of the civil rights struggle, the Nation of Islam gains a lot of currency, uh, particularly thanks to Malcolm X, who was a, a devoted follower of Elijah Muhammad until they had their falling out. Malcolm X then uh, leaves uh, the Nation of Islam and uh, joins mainstream Sunni Islam before his assassination, as does uh, Muhammad Ali, the boxer. In 1985, uh, or in 1975, Elijah Muhammad uh, dies. And within a decade, his son, who succeeds him uh, to the mantle of authority in the Nation of Islam, uh, this is uh, Wadith Deen Muhammad, he takes the vast majority of the congregation into mainstream Sunni Islam, about 90%. 10% remaining of the Nation of Islam then stay within the nation and are currently being led by the minister, Louis uh, Farrakhan. Uh, as far as the statistics go, this accounts for uh, the fact that 40% uh, of Muslims in America are African American. Uh, many of them are former Nation of Islam uh, members. Okay, great. Um, then um, you spoke about the two different sources of authority in Islam, the Quran and the Sunnah. Can you talk a little more about how the different branches of Islam use these texts and particularly the Sunnah in daily life and how are they interpreted and whose interpretations are viewed as authoritar authoritative? Sure. So when it comes to Shi'i Islam, uh, one thing for sure, uh, both sides agree on the primacy uh, and the authority of uh, the Quran. Within Shi'i Islam, uh, because of this notion of infallibility of the bloodline of the Prophet, the first 12 Imams, starting, of course, with uh, the Prophet's uh, son-in-law, Ali, and then uh, extending on uh, for uh, 11 more uh, successions, their interpretation is considered authoritative, uh, believing that they were infallible and had a very organic uh, interaction with uh, the Islamic scripture allows their interpretations to be uh, seen as uh, uh, the, the governing and uh, uh, directives. Within Sunni Islam, that is reserved for the ulama or the body of religious scholars. Now within Sunni Islam, there are four major schools of, of thought. And the best way to probably think of them is to think of them as different ways of approaching uh, the US constitution. Some will see it as being a matter of strict construction. Some will see it as being much more flexible. Some will take a more scientific and methodical approach. And whereas others will uh, see this as being uh, something that doesn't require that level of rigidity. Uh, on the main points of Islam, there is no disagreement. It's not as though one school will say, you only have to pray three times a day. Another school will say, you only have to pray five times a day. But when it comes to matters of, for example, uh, inheritance and distribution of succession uh, uh, matters, uh, when it comes to perhaps uh, intricacies of marriage, when it comes to uh, even dietary laws, you're going to find some deviation. For example, in Sunni Islam, one school uh, strongly discourages eating shellfish. Uh, another uh, uh, school of thought says anything from the sea is lawful to eat. So again, these were never meant to be uh, big issues uh, to be contentious to the point of dividing the community. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we find that people don't need much of an excuse to create divisions. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking of divisions, can you speak a little bit about the growth of Wahhabism and its impact on Islamic culture? Wahhabism is uh, primarily a nationalistic movement. And let me go ahead and explain that. In the middle of the 18th century, in the middle of the Arabian Peninsula, a man by the name of Muhammad Abdul Wahhab uh, started to preach a rather puritanical form of Islam. His big complaint was that Islam was uh, being governed, if you will, by the Ottoman Empire based in Istanbul a very large, diverse, and diffuse empire, uh, and one that was very tolerant. 
And as a result of a very cosmopolitan and tolerant empire, we find that Islam became, for lack of better words, squishy. Uh, it started to appropriate and allow uh, practices of other religions. So the veneration of Sufi or uh, ascetic saints and their shrines, something which would have been very familiar to uh, members of the Catholic persuasion, becomes allowed in, uh, in Islam. He felt that these were uh, innovations and adulterations and were taking away from the purity of Islam. But it seems as though his bigger beef was that Islam was now in the hands of non-Arabs. So he starts to preach this more fundamentalist uh, version, hoping that Islam will come back to its source, meaning the Arabian Peninsula. Well, Abdul Wahab's views probably would have died on the proverbial vine, but uh, he formed an alliance through marriage with the local tribal chieftain, a man by the name of Al Saud. And again, this was back in the middle of the 18th century, and Wahhabism probably would have uh, gone the way of the dodo, except for a few uh, really uh, convenient uh, and fortuitous uh, moves of fortune. When the family of Al Saud uh, consolidated the Arabian Peninsula in the 1920s and then moved westward to Mecca and Medina, uh, the British actually uh, started to support the Al Saud family because they uh, formed an agreement that the Al Saud family would not meddle with relations that the British had made with many of the coastal sheikhs around uh, Arabia. So as a result of that and the ideology of Wahhabism, which was at the core of uh, Al Saud and his family, we find that Wahhabism then gets cemented. And particularly given the fact that uh, the Al Saud family uh, gained control over the holiest sites of uh, Mecca and Medina in Islam, and therefore uh, the, uh, the, the magnetic nature of pilgrimage. This is what gave Wahhabism quite a bit of oxygen. Great. And then um, finally, just two more questions, and we'll have to go really quickly here because we're sure. almost out of time. One is about the Ahmadiyya community and how do they fall within one of the major sects? And when reporting on the Muslim community as a whole, how important is it to explain differences in belief? That's number one. The other one I'll go ahead and ask is actually my question. Um, and that is for non-Muslims who want to read the Quran, I've heard different techniques about what's the best way to read it. Some people say, well, it's not meant to be reading, read, um, uh, you know, chapter by chapter, you know, uh, as you would read most, most books and um, chronological, I guess I would say, what is the best way to read the Quran for non-Muslims? So that's the second question. Sure. Well, let me take the second question first. First of all, uh, I wouldn't advise reading it right to left like you do in Arabic. Uh, that would be even more confusing. <laughs> um, the Quran, uh, I've, I've seen the Penguin classic uh, Quran which uh, is a noble effort, but unfortunately, it, it's not going to take you anywhere because unlike the Bible, it's not written in a chronological order. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very, very confusing. So my advice would be to find a Quran that is annotated. And two of the best ones right now is there's a, a translation by, and full disclosure, a friend of mine by the name of Safi Kaskas, K-A-S-K-A-S, -S, which uh, has in it 3,000 references to the Bible uh, just as cross-reference. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful uh, source uh, uh, book. And the other is uh, The Study Quran, written by Professor Sayyid Hussein Nasser from George Washington University. Uh, both of them, I think, are excellent places to start because, again, they're very well annotated and they're very accessible. Now, on the subject of the Ahmadiyya, the Ahmadiyya would fall, if you're taking a look at the, uh, the two major branches of Islam, they would fall within the Sunni sect. But where they differ is that they claim that uh, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of, uh, of uh, the Ahmadiyya movement, was himself a prophet. So this is considered by many Muslims to be in violation of a central tenet of Islam, namely that the prophet Muhammad was the final prophet. So that has uh, caused uh, quite a bit of tension for the Ahmadiyya, and particularly in uh, Pakistan from where they emanate, given the fact that they are a religious minority and the fact that uh, the state has officially uh, categorized them as being non-Muslim 
it has led to uh, quite a bit of discrimination, uh, persecution, and, and violence against them. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know we're a couple minutes over, but um, this is one of the thorniest topics for journalists in the U.S. to cover, I think, and um, historically we've done a poor job. So I really appreciate your time, Saeed. I appreciate the history and background and context, and I know um, all of our Honda scholars are uh, similarly appreciative. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and... Uh,